Welcome everyone to noon, Noontime Prayer and the reading of Psalm 17. I'm really glad you're, you're with us today and um, just excited to be doing this. It's raining here, which is good because rain keeps people inside and from keeping them from gathering. I hope you're all well and doing well. I hope you're enjoying your time at home with family and with each other. As I was praying this morning, I felt led to pray for our conference and for our denomination, but specifically for our conference. Our annual meeting is coming up this Friday and Saturday. Friday will be the ministerial meeting and then Saturday will be the actual conference annual meeting all over Zoom. So this will be interesting because we're having our annual meeting as a church on May 17th on Sunday after church or after our service. So if you're a member, I, I would ask that you plan on joining us for that meeting. It's important to have your voice. But let's begin with prayer for our upcoming annual meeting and for our conference and for the covenant. Father, just I thank you for today. I thank you for sunshine and for rain. I thank you for the beauty of creation all around us, for ocean waves, mountain beauty, mountain majesty, Lord. Father, I lift up our conference to you as we approach the annual meeting. This is a first for us in our lifetime, having to have a meeting over Zoom and not being able to meet in person. I pray that you would be with Greg Yee, our superintendent, as he delivers his report. I think they're going to limit the reports to just a minimum, but I pray for much wisdom for he and Don Toyolo and Eric Cave, Keith Tungseth, Chris Back, Peter Sung, and the rest of the office, Lord. I pray that you would give them much wisdom, much care, the heart of Jesus' compassion. I pray that as the annual meeting begins, both the ministerium and the general annual meeting for our conference, Lord, that you would bless the meeting, that you would bless our decisions. I know we weathered just a difficult year last year. And so I pray for a spirit of unity for healing. I pray that you would unite us as one body with Jesus Christ as the head. And I also pray for other conferences as they will be meeting and for our national church who has decided not to have an annual meeting this year. These are strange times, Lord. And so I just pray that for all the churches in our conference and all the churches across the United States, both in our evangelical covenant, but for all churches who put their faith in Christ, that you would strengthen us even as we're not able to meet together, that we would not be complacent in our care and love for each other, that we would not become complacent in our listening to your word and being strengthened on the words of grace. As this pandemic drags on, Lord, I know last night I was just feeling overwhelmed. And then I was reminded of, of my own message to keep Jesus before us, to keep Jesus both as our goal and our guide and our counselor, the one who leads us in paths of righteousness. So again, Father, I just pray for all of us, those who are listening and those who will yet listen and watch on YouTube, Lord, that you would encourage us deeply in our spirit, that the joy of the Lord might be full in us because of your presence in us. 
I pray that you would strengthen us with power in our inner being through your Spirit, that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith and that we, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that we may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now to you, Lord, who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to you be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever, forever and ever. And so, Father, I just pray for everyone listening and everyone watching for that deep encouragement, for that deep knowledge of your love, that we would not lose our wonder of the one through whom all things have been created. Thank you for knitting us together while we were yet in our mother's womb. Thank you for the glory that's in store for us in the future. Thank you for your presence with us, that you will by no means never, no, never, ever leave us nor forsake us. Thank you that the breadth and width and height and depth of your love is greater than the ocean. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, thanks for joining me. We're going to be reading Psalm 17 today. And so I'll go ahead and read through it, and then we'll return and, and look at the verses closely. Psalm 17, a prayer of David. Hear a just cause, O Lord. Give heed to my cry. Give ear to my prayer, which is not from deceitful lips. Let my judgment come forth from your, from your presence. Let your eyes look with equity. You have tried my heart. You have visited me by night. You have tested me and you find nothing. I purpose that my mouth will not transgress. As for the deeds of men, by the word of your lips, I have kept from the paths of the violent. My steps have held fast to your paths. My feet have not slipped. I have called upon you, for you will answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me. Hear my speech. Wondrously show your loving kindness. O Savior of those who take refuge at your right hand from those who rise up against them, keep me as the apple of the eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings from the wicked who despoil me, my deadly enemies who surround me. They have closed their unfeeling heart. With their mouth they speak proudly. They have now surrounded us in our steps they set their eyes to cast us down to the ground. He is like a lion that is eager to tear, and as a young lion lurking in hiding places. Arise, O Lord, confront him, bring him low. Deliver my soul from the wicked with your sword, from men with your hand, O Lord, from men of the world whose portion is this life and whose belly you fill with treasure. They are satisfied with children and leave their abundance to their babes. As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. I will be satisfied with your likeness when I awake. Let me just pray one more time for God's intervening presence. Father, just not... Thank you for this day again, and I just pray once again that you'd fill me with your Holy Spirit and all of us with, with an extraordinary measure, a great measure of your Spirit's power and truth. Father, you know I can't do this without you, so I pray that you give me clarity of mind and clarity of purpose, clarity of speech, even help me to enunciate my words properly. 
And I pray that you'd bring me to say everything I need to and keep me from saying the things I don't. And I pray for everyone listening and yet those who are yet to listen, that you would give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and open hearts and open lives to receive the word implanted. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Psalm 17 is a chiastic prayer. A chiasm is a rhetorical structure. It's a structure of either written language or of spoken language that has a pattern to it. And because it was oral culture, it helped people hear the ideas that were passing by their ears. And so a chiasm had a structure that you went into the center and then you retreated from the center either by saying the same thing twice or by contrasting with, with what you've just said. And so it's that center piece that's most important. And this whole Psalm 17, all 17 verses, create a chiastic structure or a chiasm, however you would have it. And so let's take a look at Psalm 17. He says, Hear a just cause, O Lord. Give he heed to my cry. Give ear to my prayer, which is not from deceitful lips. Let my judgment come forth from your presence. Let your eyes look with equity. So right, right from the beginning, this is a prayer. And he has three words he uses right in a row to describe his prayer. Hear, give heed, and give ear. So he's asking God to listen to him. Very specifically, will you hear me, Lord? Will you listen to me? And then what is he asking God to hear? A just cause. So David is in the midst of being accused by these enemies of his. It may very well be Saul or Absalom, but David had a lot of enemies, so we don't really know. It's not described to us in the psalm, uh, the purpose for this psalm. And the language used in this, these first two verses is reminiscent of the courtroom. It's all courtroom language. So he's asking God to put him and his enemies on trial and to declare him just, to examine him and to declare his, him just. Hear a just cause, O Lord. Again, O Lord is the name Yahweh. And so we know it's the most holy name of God. And yet we also know that when Jesus came on the planet, he repeatedly said that I am who I am, I am, I am, which is the verbal form of the name Yahweh, is what the, the scholars think. So hear a just cause, O Lord. Give heed to my cry. And so this is a fervent cry of David's. He may have been very well hiding out in the cave when, when he wrote this. We're not sure. That's why I used uh, the cave motif in, in this psalm. Give heed to my cry. Give ear to my prayer. And then he adds, which is not from deceitful lips. So he's not lying. He's not making a case in the courtroom that it's untrue which infers that his enemies are making a case that are untrue. It's an indirect way of saying to his enemies that they're the ones lying. So you decide between me and them who's telling the truth. Let my judgment come forth from your presence. So show up between us, Lord, and let that judgment come. Exonerate me. Show that I'm innocent. Let your eyes look with equity. The word equity means... Uh, let me see if I can find it. It's, it's an adverb to mean to act justly or rightly. So look at our case with right judgment. Fairly decide the case. And so God, he's asking God to be fair between he and his enemies. And so this first section, this first section of the chiasm, David cries for judgment and justice. Judgment between he and his enemies and he cries for that justice would be met, whatever it is. That's a scary prayer. I think about David's life and later on in his life, I think that this is pre-Bathsheba and Uriah. It makes me kind of nervous. I know he's speaking about a, a singular case here. He's speaking about enemies who are threatening him. But later in his life, if he were to pray this prayer, as Nathan the prophet would uh, said to him, you are entirely condemned. And so with all of us, 
Who can pray this? Can you pray this? I look at my own life. Even recently, some of the dumb things I've done. I have a master's in making bad choices. And so I've learned to distrust myself and put my trust in Jesus. And put my trust in the Holy Spirit. And put my trust in the love that God has for you and I. So David cries for judgment and justice. This heralds the day coming when there will be two judgments, the great white throne judgment, which is for those who have not received Christ, and then the judgment seat of Christ called the Bema seat, where we will be rewarded for the good things we've done via his Holy Spirit and via his grace. And all those things we did by the flesh and all those sins will be burnt up. There's going to be quite a bonfire for you and for me. But think of that. It's good news. I'll be addressing it this Sunday. It's good news because those things will be burnt up. They will be no more. So David cries for judgment and justice. So we see this is the A1 in, in the chiastic prayer, in the chiasm. David's, David's cry for judgment and justice. Then we go, go on in the, in the psalm to the next verses. You have tried my heart. You have visited, visited me by night. You have tested me and you find nothing. I have purposed that my mouth will not transgress. So you have tried my heart. You have tested it. You have put me to the test. And what he's getting at is, I passed. I passed the test. You have visited me by night. When do most people do the most wicked things? At night, when nobody can see, when the doors are closed, and so on. And so David is saying, you've even come to me at night and seen that I was walking in uprightness during the night. You have tested me and you find nothing. Hmm. That's true of David in this instance, in this circumstance, but it's not true of David's life overall. He was a man after God's own heart. But in one, one fell swoop, he broke, as one of my good friends, Don Mills used to say, he broke all of the... Ten Commandments in one fell swoop. I'm not sure he broke all ten, but he broke most of them, including committing adultery, coveting after your neighbor's wife, murder, stealing, the, the list goes on. You have tested me and you find nothing. In this occasion, David was saying, I'm just, I've acted rightly. I have purposed that my mouth will not transgress. I'm not going to attack, I'm not going to let my mouth get the better of me. You ever let the, your mouth get the better of you? Sometimes I say things and I wish I had never opened my mouth. It would have been wiser if I just bit my tongue and not said a word. And so David calls for an investigation of his integrity. He's asking God for the in investigation, knowing that as God investigates him, he's not going to find anything wrong at this point in his life. He's not going to find that what the accusers are blaming him of, it's untrue. At the same time as he calls for this, he's calling for an investigation of his enemy's cause, whether they're just or not, and the implication is they're, that they're not just. And the, the, that same part of the chiastic structure continues. As for the deeds of men, by the words of your lips, I have kept from the paths of the violent. So now he thinks about the overall global deeds of, of humankind. And he's saying, by the words of your lips, I have kept from the paths of the violent. And so again, he's not attributing his integrity to his own cause, but to the words that fall from Yahweh's lips or even from Jesus' lips. It's by that word that he is able to keep from the paths of the violent. In his case, they that would have been certainly speaking of the law. And the, the law, in David's time, there was no chronicles, there was no book of kings. They haven't been written yet. I don't think Samuel had been been put down on paper yet, because Samuel is describing well, it hadn't been because it's describing David's life, and so the words that he's talking about would have been 
the five books of the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And so by knowing that word which, fall, which falls from the Lord's lips, I have kept from the paths of the violent. I think later on, David becomes a very violent man, so much so that the Lord won't allow him to build the temp temple because he has blood on his hands. God never rejects David. David, he declares that David is a man after his own heart. But this being kept from the paths of violence, he's not retaliating against either Saul or Absalom or whoever this enemy is. My steps have held fast to your paths. My feet have not slipped. Those paths would have been, paths, paths would have been described as the path of the law, walking within that covenant of law that the Israelites had with God. Even Paul says something very similar, that as to the law, I'm found blameless. He's walked in the paths of righteousness. So David calls for an investigation of his integrity. He says, examine me, Lord. And by saying that, he's also, as I said before, examine my enemies. And then, so here we have the chiasm. Then we have A1, David cries for judgment and justice. And then B1, David calls for an investigation of his integrity. And now we move on to the centerpiece, part of the centerpiece of the psalm. I've called upon you, for you will answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me. Hear my speech. Wondrously show your loving kindness, O Savior of those who take refuge at your right hand, from those who rise up against me. So I, I didn't realize the chiasm was here until after I had formatted the verses. So this is kind of more than one part of the chiasm is, are in these verses. So C1 says, I have called upon you, for you will answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me, hear my speech. So again, he's returning to that motif of prayer. He's calling upon, upon Yahweh. He's calling upon God to answer him. And again, incline your ear, just as in verse 1. Incline your ear, hear my speech. Hear what I'm saying to you. And so that forms the first part of the C1. David calls to God to intervene. We can call to God to intervene. As a church, I'm hoping that with one voice, we, we are calling to God to intervene in this pandemic. Yet as the same, at the same time, as I've said before, I don't want to stand in the way of what God is doing. I don't believe he's caused this by any means. But I do know he's allowing it in his sovereignty. And so I don't want to stand in the way of what he might be doing in people's hearts around the world and in our lives around the world. One thing is coming clear, what's important? Not economies, not politics, not wealth, but our human relationships, our love for one another. You know, that's the only thing you can take with you is the quality of your relationships. And especially with those who we will, with whom we will spend eternity. Those who have entrusted their life to Christ as well. You are my eternal friends. We're going to know each other and we will be much better friends there than here. Here we have all of our idiosyncrasies. So David again is calling for God to intervene. What a wonderful prayer for us in these days. I've called upon you, for you will answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me, hear my speech. And so that's the first part of the C1 of the chiasm. David calls to intervene. And then we get God's wondrous loving kindness as a center of this psalm. It's his hesed love. And so that second section, wondrously show your loving kindness, O Savior, of those who take refuge at your right hand from those who rise up against them. Wondrously show your loving kindness. That word loving kindness is the word hesed in the Hebrew language. It means a long-suffering love, a steadfast love, 
a love that never gives up on, on, on a person. He's never given up on you. He's never given up on me. To the covenant people, it was that love that loved them even when they blew it. That loved them to the extent that God would allow them to be carried into exile. First, the northern kingdom of Israel in 786 BC, I think it was. And then the north, uh, southern tribes, the southern kingdom of Judah in seven in no, 722 and 586. There we go. In 586, when Babylon carried Israel away. And so, even that was God's love. Bringing the Israelites out of their idolatry. What is going to bring our nation out of the idolatry of the worship of self? What is going to bring the world out of our idolatry of the worship of gods other than the true God? And for David, the centerpiece in asking God to intervene is wondrously show your loving kindness. It's more than I can know. It's wondrous. It's awesome. It's incredible. It's fantastic. I think about my own life and the depths to which I had descended into perversion and sin. And yet that hesed love, that stick to it love, that long-suffering love where, we, where God never gave up on me, Hear this, he will never give up on you. No matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter how deep the pit, as Corey Ten Boom said, his love is yet deeper still. While we were yet sinners, in this is love, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Wondrously show your loving kindness. That loving kindness in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, was between the nation of Israel that Hesed love, it was covenant love between the nation of Israel and God. In the New Testament, that loving kindness is between God the Father and God the Son, and we are in Christ in the covenant. He is our covenant representative. And now we are in this love out of which Jesus declares, I will never leave you nor ever by no means ever forsake you. Five negatives piled up in that verse in Hebrews 13. I think it's verse 5. Or again, in Matthew 28, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Emmanuel, God with us. That loving kindness that never gives up on us. The sheepdogs of his goodness and mercy that pursue us throughout life. Bringing us home, bringing us back to the fold. Bringing us back onto the path, paths of righteousness. Wondrously show your loving kindness, O Savior, of those who take refuge at your right hand. So he's saying, wondrously show, it's still part of the prayer, show your hesed love, that long-suffering covenant love, to those who take refuge in you as their Savior, who take refuge at your right hand. The right hand of a king was the, that place of favor. And so those who were within the covenant of the law with the covenant of Moses between God and the nation of Israel. Those who were seeking their salvation in Yahweh, who take refuge in the king, in God as king. They're the ones who David is requesting to show that loving kindness. In the new covenant, we see something entirely different. We are to love our enemies we are to pray for those who persecute us. I think about all the politicization of this pandemic on both sides. All the attacks on President Trump. All the attacks on uh, Nancy Pelosi and Mitch McConnell in the Senate and the House of Representatives. Let's get this straight. They're all a bunch of sinners, just as we are all a bunch of sinners. And God loves every one of these people to the extent that he gave up his life and his spirit that we might live and that they might live. 
His love knows no bounds. And so we have this wondrous opportunity to pray that he would wondrously show his new covenant love, the same thing, his love hasn't changed. But it's not just for those who are in the covenant. For God so loved the world, meaning every human being that has ever lived from the time of Adam and Eve, from the creation of Adam and Eve, until the day of destruction, the day of the Lord, at the end of time. Wondrously show your loving kindness, O Savior, of those who take refuge at your right hand. Our lives, according to Colossians, are hidden in Christ at the right hand of God. We're already there. We, we have taken refuge in Christ. And so if you haven't taken refuge in Christ, I urge you to do so. Just call out to him. Save me, Jesus. Please forgive me. You can't fix yourself but you're entrusting yourself into the hands of a surgeon who can do everything necessary and everything need needful. The moment you believe, when you, when you are persuaded that he is, that Jesus is the creator, when you are persuaded that Jesus is the Messiah, the one who came to take our sin upon his own body and die, when you understand those things, and come to believe because you've been persuaded. At that moment, you're giving eternal life. Your life is hidden with Christ at the right hand of God, which means nothing can touch us on this earth. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. Nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord, that hesed love that pursues you throughout your life, that is pursue, pursuing you even now. Wondrously show your loving kindness, O Savior, of those who take refuge at your right hand, from those who rise up against them. Right now, it's not a human being that's rising up against us. It's a virus. But there are human beings that are against us. I think of those of you who are serving in Iraq, you have very real enemies that rise up against you. And so my prayer for you is that God would wondrously show his, lo his loving kindness, that long suffering, the pursuit of his love for you. And so we see, we keep going. This is the, the C2 in a, in a sense. We've that centerpiece of th that wondrous loving kindness, and now we start backing out. Keep me as an apple of the eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings from the wicked who despoil me, my deadly enemies who surround me. He says, keep me as the apple of, of the eye. This is not a literal translation. There's no word apple in the original text. It's an idiom. This is the closest English idiom we can get to the Hebrew idiom. It literally says, keep me as the pupil of your eye. And I go, huh? What's that mean? Well, keeping you as the pupil of your eye, the, the pupil is the very center part of your eye. And so it's, it's an, a Jewish idiom, a Hebrew idiom, of asking God to keep us at the center of his focus. Keep me as the apple of, of the eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. I love the Hebrew poetry, and they think pictorially, as I've said so many times. And so now it's the, the picture of the mother hen who gathers her hens beneath her wings and covers them, even if it costs her her own life. One of my favorite teachers, Malcolm Smith, gives the illustration of he was in a barnyard one time after a fire. The fire had burned down the whole barnyard. And as they were walking through, he saw what looked like a burnt up rag and he kicked it. And as he kicked it, it kind of folded over and all these little chicks run out from underneath the charred body of the, of the mother hen. God will go to any extreme to keep us safe. To the extreme that he would give up his life on the cross for you. That he would give up his very breath and spirit trusting that God would raise him from the dead, just as you and I must trust that God will raise us from the dead when we take our final breath. 
God will go to any extreme to keep you beneath the shadow of his wings. So this request of David, hide me in the shadow of your wings. Do you know that as new covenant people, we are always hidden in the shadow of, of Yahweh's wings, of Jesus' wings. We are always the pupil in the center of his eye, always the center of his focus. In the chapter 1 Corinthians on, on God's love, I think it is, a beautiful painting painted by words by the Apostle Paul. He says, God does not seek his own. Love does not seek its own. God's love does not seek its own. He's always seeking your highest good. Keep me in the apple as the apple of the eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. From the wicked who despoil me, my deadly enemies who surround me, whether it's Saul or Absalom or other enemies that he encountered, he's asking for God's protection. He's asking God to intervene to keep them from despoiling him. Let me get that word up, despoil. It's further down here. Here we go. A verb meaning to be burly, to ravage, to destroy, to oppress, to assault, to spoil, to lay waste, to, to devastate. The primary meaning of the verb is to devastate or destroy from the wicked who want to destroy my life. Sounds like Saul. Sounds like Absalom. Sounds like a whole lot of other enemies. Right now we don't have, well, we do have the enemy of Satan and his cohorts who are always attacking us. But we have this deadly enemy of this virus. So keep us as the apple of your eye, Lord. Hide us in the shadow of your wings from this deadly enemy of COVID-19. Can't we call out to God that he would intervene in any circumstances you find yourself in? Whether it's illness, financial trouble, relational strife, children who are addicted, parents who are addicted, sexual perversity. We have loved ones falling into sexual perversity. And so we see in the chiasm, then A1, David cries for judgment and justice. David called, B1, David calls for an investigation of his integrity and by so doing an investigation of his enemy's lack of integrity. David calls to God to intervene and that wondrous centerpiece, God's wondrous loving kindness. He's reminded and calls for God's wondering, wondrous loving kindness, that stick to it love, that long-suffering covenant love to be a shield to him, to be a to be his guard, to, to protect him. And now we have backed out to David calls to intervene again. We move on in the psalm. They have closed their unfeeling heart, now speaking of David's enemies, with their mouth they speak proudly. They have now surrounded us in our steps. They set their eyes to cast us down to the ground. He is like a lion that is eager to tear, and as a young lion lurking in hiding places. This sounds very much like Saul, King Saul, who is hell-bent on destroying David. He was after David to kill him. So was Absalom, though. But David was having to hide out in caves. Remember the story when Saul was after him and David was hiding out in a cave and he came and stole a couple of articles to show that his integrity, that he was not going to hurt the king. But Saul would not give up. Absalom, his own son, was determined to kill David and take over his throne, as well as other enemies. And so it says, they have closed their unfeeling heart. These enemies have no compassion. They have no heart. They have no mind, if you will, to the Hebrew people. Heart was again their mind. So they have closed their unfeeling mind, which would include the emotions. People with closed minds are sometimes very dangerous people. They will not listen to truth. Their minds cannot be changed. 
with their mouth they speak proudly i think oops that's our besetting sin every one of us struggles with pride every person i've ever met struggles with pride and so many times with men it's a battle of pride and with women between each other it's a battle of pride pride seems to be the the sin of the garden of eden that we thought we could be like god knowing good and evil that we wouldn't need god as god anymore that we could just use him as our helper asking him to show up when we need him we thought we could produce a righteousness of our own we thought we think we can produce an adequate devotional life of our own from our side we think that we can provide the path of righteousness by all the rules of our own making and isaiah comes along and says your righteousness is as filthy rags literally as menstrual rags in that day that was um thought to be an extreme uncleanliness because of the nature of blood and its decay. Nuff said. With their mouth they speak proudly. They boast. We're going to get that, David. We're going to kill him. They have now surrounded us in our steps. Again, it sounds like King Saul to me or Absalom. David is hiding out in a cave with King Saul and hiding out, running. And every time David es escapes, they set their eyes to cast us down to the ground. Their whole purpose in pursuing us, in pursuing David and his men, are to cast them down to the ground, to destroy them. And then this very poignant description of the enemy that's pursuing David, and it would be the leader of the band of enemies, so whether it's King Saul or Absalom or another one of David's enemies, he is like a lion that is eager to tear, and as a young lion lurking in hiding places. When I was young, I used to like to watch animal shows. I never liked the, the parts where they show, showed the lion taking down the prey and then just voraciously ripping that flesh or when the lion is lurking in the grass, ready, ready to pounce. David likens his enemies to a lurking lion that's ready to tear he and his men's flesh asunder. So in this sense, David lists his complaints to God against his enemies. He has this catalog of, of complaints, as one commentary listed it. David lists his complaints against his enemies. And within the chiastric structure, we had David, A1, David cries for judgment and, and justice. And then B1, David calls for an investigation of his integrity. And now B2, David lists his complaints against his enemies. And so this is a contrast with what David had said in B1. In B1, he says, try me, Lord, look at me, investigate me. You're not going to find anything wrong in this, in this occasion. And now in B2, he says, now, but look at my enemies. This is my list of complaints against them. They're trying to kill your anointed one, is the drift of it. And again, not to miss that centerpiece that God, that David is calling for that wondrous loving kindness of God. Reminding God, don't forget the covenant. And for us, reminding God, don't forget the covenant, the new covenant in Jesus' blood for which he died for us. And then we move on in, in the psalm. And it says, Arise, O Lord, confront him. Bring him low, this enemy, whether it's King Saul or Absalom or whoever. Deliver my soul from the wicked with your sword, from men with your hand. Arise, O Lord, arise, Yahweh. And for us, arise, Jesus. Confront this enemy. Bring this enemy low. Well, we're talking about COVID-19 in our, in our circumstance, but also Satan and his cohorts. And whatever enemies you may be dealing with in your in your life we pray for our enemies we pray for those we bless those who persecute us arise O Lord stand up wake up stand up it's very bold language confront him bring him low 
They're wanting to bring David to the ground. Now there's this play. David is not saying, I'm going to bring them to the ground, but Lord, you do a miracle. You bring my enemies to their knees. You bring them low. Deliver my soul from the wicked with your sword. So he's not claiming that he's going to take up action. Either if this is Saul against the king, if it's his own son, he's not going to take up the sword against his own son. He's asking God. This sounds very much like Saul to me. Deliver my soul from the wicked with your sword. God, you take care of this. You bring your sword into the picture, which means actually a call for their destruction. From men with your hand, O Lord. He's asking God to rise up and to lift his hand, to lift their arm, which always meant God's action. He's asking God to act. We can pray, deliver our soul from this pandemic with your sword, with your hand, O Lord. And so we see that David requests God to confront his enemies. Can you ask God to confront your enemies, to bring them low, to intervene with his sword and with his hand? It continues, from men of the world, whose portion is this life and whose belly you fill with your treasure, meaning all the good food and all that wonderful bounty that we have in so many wonderful things to eat and drink and whose belly you fill with your treasure, they are satisfied with children and leave their abundance to their babes. So what David is getting at, these men who are pursuing his, him, his enemies, they've lost sight of God. They've lost sight of any hope of a life after the grave even though limited in the, in the Hebrew scriptures, it was there. Their whole focus is on this life, what they can get now, the food in their stomachs, and that whatever wealth they, they gather, they can pass it on to their children. So if you look again, he says, Arise, O Lord, confront him. Deliver my soul from the wicked, from the men of the world whose portion is this life. and whose belly you fill with your treasure. Even David understands that God still provides for those who are wicked. His rain falls on both the righteous and the wicked. They are satisfied with children and leave their abundance to their babes. You get the sense in this psalm that David understands that God still loves these men, these enemies. And yet doesn't keep David from calling for justice to be done. And sometimes David is a sword of the Lord to bring that justice. Sometimes you, we see throughout the Hebrew scripture that people become so evil, especially when it has to do with children. These societies that were sacrificing children, they became so evil that God asked the Israelites to stamp those nations out. And we go, how could God be, be like that? Well, I think that when you've seen the level of evil that human beings can do, and when you come against children, Jesus declares anyone who causes one of these little ones to stumble, it would have been better for them to have tied a millstone around their neck and be thrown into to the sea. David is asking for a confrontation. So in the chiasm again, we won't read through the whole thing, but David cries for judgment and justice. And at the end, he calls for God. He requests God to confront his enemies. So you have this beautiful structure in this psalm. And again, the centerpiece is that God's wondrous loving kindness that has been fully realized in Jesus Christ, where loving kindness was to the old covenant, grace is as to the, is as to the new covenant. That wonderful, unmerited, undeserved, kind and generous power of God to forgive, save, and transform broken and sinful lives forever and ever. When he does his work, it isn't just half-baked. He saves us unto eternity. The moment you believe, you're given the gift of eternal life. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me, has eternal life. She does not come into judgment, 
but has passed from death to life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Oh, the Hesed love of God. Oh, the tender, merciful grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is still part of that A2, but it seems almost like a postscript. It says, as for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. David is saying, in my integrity of my life, I can behold your face. We know that no one can see God and live. So he's speaking metaphorically here. He can gaze upon that face, which is all of loving kindness and goodness and grace and truth. Later on, Paul or David would not be able to pray this prayer. I shall behold your face in righteousness. The shame that he must have lived with over Uriah and Bathsheba is unthinkable. I will be satisfied with your likeness when I wake. When we wake in the morning, his mercies are new every morning. His compassions are with us throughout the day. We wake up to his presence and he is beautiful. We wake up to his presence, to the presence of his wonderful, long-suffering love for us. When we wake up in the morning, we wake up to his grace. We wake up to his mercy. We wake up to that understanding, surpassing peace. When we wake in the morning, we wake up to that incredible joy, the joy of the Lord. It's his joy, and we have it because he lives within. When we wake in the morning, everything's new again. And so you have, David ends with a proclamation of his confidence in God. He's asked for God to... He's asked for God in the courtroom of heaven to try him. He asked for God for judgment, for God to sit on his throne of judgment and to bring justice to his cause. He then asked God to investigate his integrity at the same time to investigate his opponent's lack of integrity. He then calls God to intervene and calls on God's long-suffering covenant love. to be about protecting him. He again calls God to intervene. And then he gives that list of complaints against his enemy in contrast to his own in integrity. And lastly, he again prays that God would confront his enemies, that, he would, that God would bring them low, that God would bring them to their knees. I love how the Holy Spirit has woven scripture, scripture together, how he has so beautifully constructed this poetry this Psalm of David, this prayer of David. We can end with the proclamation of our confidence. Even in the midst of this pandemic, if you keep your eyes resolutely focused on Jesus, with him having you as the pupil of his eye, with you the center of his focus and me, hiding beneath the shadow of his wings, taking refuge in the shadow of his wings. He's the mother hen who will go to all extremes to protect our lives, whether here on earth or whether he translates us to that eternal life which is in heaven. Wondrously show your loving kindness to us, O Lord. Wondrously show your grace to us, O Lord, a grace which we will never exhaust a grace which we can never fathom, a grace that knows no bounds, a grace that is sheer extravagance. He loves us. He has graced us. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you for this psalm. I thank you for the beauty of how the psalm is put together and that centerpiece of remembering your Hesed love. And for us, it's Hesed love, but it's described in the word of grace and that unconditional, boundless, limitless, immeasurable love of Christ and the immeasurable love of God. Father, I pray that again, that you would make that real love, to, that, real, that love real to everyone who is listening today, that by the power of your 
Holy Spirit, you would strengthen us in our inner being so that Christ may dwell in our heart through faith. We have no hope of being righteous or having in the integrity of life within ourselves. We have all failed you in so many ways. We have all fallen short of your glory in innumerable ways, uncountable ways. And so our hope is to stand in grace. Your word says, have, therefore, since we have been justified, acquitted by faith, by trusting you, we have peace with God. You're no longer our enemy, Lord. We have perfect peace with you, which will endure through all eternity. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not something that we have created ourselves, but you have created it for us in the death and resurrection of Jesus. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom we have obtained access into this grace, into this hesed love in which we now stand. And so our only standing, Lord, our only sure footing, is nothing of ourselves, nothing of our own works, nothing of our own goodness or righteousness, but all of grace, all of your boundless, immeasurable love. We stand in grace. And Lord, help us to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Today, may your spirit be active in our life, bringing us to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Keep us from focusing on law and rules and all of the commandments and teachings of men which we, we can so easily fall into. Give us discerning hearts, Lord. May the Holy Spirit open up wide to us the things freely given, those things by which we have been graced. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, thank you for joining me today. Tomorrow we're going to be doing Psalm 18, and it's 50 verses, so there's no way I'll be able to work through the psalm in the same way I've been doing this. So I haven't really studied it yet, but I'm going to be reading through it and then maybe take one portion or take the psalm overall and not do an in-depth study of it. It's, it's not possible, but tomorrow we'll be doing Psalm 18. So if you want to read it ahead of time, I invite you to read it. Sit down, maybe read it with your spouse or with your family or just by yourself. Or you can just wait till, till tomorrow and, and read it along with me. And then on Friday, I won't be here for noontime prayer and, and the reading of the Psalms because it's our annual ministerial meeting of our North, North Pacific Conference. And so I'll be busy that day. And then we'll be back on Sunday with our continuing study of 2 Corinthians. This time we're going to be looking at the judgment seat of Christ, that judgment seat of reward and that bonfire that blessingly or that blessedly will burn up all of the things which we have done out of selfishness and rebellion, out of revenge and resentment and bitterness and anger. Oh, for that day when we can be beyond that day and holy and fully righteous. No more lying. No more sin. Just being with God forever. Just being in the presence of Jesus for all eternity. And just being in each other's presence as eternal friends. Thanks again for coming. We have a blessing from 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 16 and 17. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and, and word. Hopefully we'll see you tomorrow. Grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ.